Hi, this is Bob Wetterman from BEST. Today we're going to be talking about the new Section 8 in the JSTANDARD 001 Revision H. That is, Section 8 has to do with cleanliness and residue testing requirements and what this means potentially to your manufacturing operation. So let's get started with an overview of Section 8 on cleanliness testing based on the JSTANDARD 001H that was released in 2020. So how did we get here? Well, previous versions were based on rows testing. In rows testing, what we had was a single go, no-go number, and any values, residue values below 1.56 micrograms NACL equivalent per centimeter squared, uh, any, anything um, less than that was deemed to be acceptable. Anything greater than that was deemed to be dirty or a defect. So ROSE testing was initially developed as a process monitoring tool because in ROSE testing, the whole assembly is immersed in the effluent consisting of water and solvent. And the residues are dissolved within that liquid, and then the liquid is measured. So it is a test by which the entirety of the circuit board is measured. So ROSE testing was developed in the 1970s by the Navy, but those were in the days when it was primarily a through-hole assembly world, and the component spacing and component standoff heights were much, much greater than they are today. In addition, the process window was much greater at that point. We were dealing with rosin-based fluxes, much more active fluxes than today, and CFC-based cleaners that were very aggressive. So after the adoption of this J standard revision, the ROSE testing is now deemed to be an obsolete practice. So the Navy established this 1.56 micrograms per sodium chloride equivalent per centimeter as the pass-fail criteria. It was developed through a series of tests and data was submitted and the standard was developed. In those days, in the 1970s when the standard was developed, the environments were much, much different where the printed circuit board assembly would live. Today, we have uh, mining and space and the human body, both interior and exterior, and a lot of Internet of Things devices. And uh, circuit boards are subject to a lot more harsh conditions. So this, where we are today with respect to printed circuit board assemblies, is now soils can hide beneath devices that only have a two to three mil standoff height from the center of uh, the device. So think in terms of an LGA or a QFN that is seated very close to the surface of the board. It's very difficult for those soils to come out. And the uh, testing of those soils becomes very difficult. The space in between the components is much more aggressive. You know, we get three or four mils between the edge of an RF shield and a neighboring component that may be underneath the shield. Fluxes are less aggressive, so our process windows are a lot tighter. And it's more critical, more critical than ever, to make sure these boards live in harsh environments such as space, oil wells, or underneath vehicles even. Even though ROSE testing will be an obsolete process with respect to a no-go, go, no go gauge on cleanliness, ROSE testing can still be used for process monitoring. We don't have to throw our ROSE testers away. We can tell if the tanks are contaminated, for example. Again, we're measuring the entirety of the uh, assembly or the process environment. I can tell if a saponifier uh, mixture ratio has been altered. 
and we're not cleaning as readily as we once had been, the uh, equivalency rating would go up and hence Borgs would seem to be quote unquote dirtier with respect to the rose testing, but it would at least tell you if the saponifier mixture ratio has not been mixed properly or has changed. It can also indicate the rose testing that is that a reflow profile has run into problems. So for example, if we are not fully activating all our fluxes, we're gonna leave behind more active species in terms of the residue or the soils and the rose testing can pick that up. So the rose testing can still answer the question, what has changed? So what has changed is the standard has changed. Section eight outlines uh, the new testing guidelines for cleanliness and measurement of residues. Uh, the IPC has launched a white paper, 019A like Apple, and it's a companion docu document to the J standard. And it's more of a uh, process document and then it answers the question, how do I actually do this? How do I do this testing? So if we're migrating from the old ROSE standard to the new standard, how does that impact you? Well, let's take the example of a board that has been assembled for a long period of time. ROSE testing has been utilized to measure the cleanliness of the assembly. And there have been no problems with respect to reliability based on residues migrating. And this residue migration um, has not been seen because of uh, the dirtiness, if you will, of the board under biased conditions and under temperature and um, humidity accelerated testing. And if that is truly the case, then we could continue to use ROSE testing as our standard go no go gauge. So that allows for the grandfathering in of the ROSE testing. Otherwise, we're going to have to do some testing. And the testing will have to include what's called objective evidence. And this objective evidence means that we're going to have to figure out whether any of the chemical species on the board, that is flux residue or other items, don't impact the electronics assembly reliability in environments where there is temperature differences and where there are relative humidity differences. So data can be generated by a variety of tests some people like to use ionic cleanliness testing. Uh, ionic cleanliness testing requires that you either have such a tester in-house or you have to send that out, which is the case for, for most EMS companies of any reasonable size. And uh, that certainly becomes expensive. But somehow there has to be a linkage to a bias-based test that is a voltage-based test that could get those species or the residues to move under temperature or humidity um, pressures. So when will we have to use or determine whether or not objective evidence needs to be in place? Here's some uh, ideas as to when you would have to do this. First of all, when a flux is changed out, that could be a manufacturer, that could be a flux type, um, that could be uh, the manufacturing location of the flux. When cleaning agents or cleaning agent mix ratios are changed. When flux suppliers are changed, when cleaning suppliers are changed, when you go from cleaning supplier A to B. Changes in soldering material, soldering, obviously has uh, sol or solder in most instances has some kind of flux in included therein. So that's definitely gonna change uh, what kind of residues are left over. Changes in board metallization. Are we going from an immersion silver to a nickel gold, for example? 
changes in solder mass that could entrap uh, residues on a board. Uh, changes in solder mass finish, by the way, can do that as well. Geographic changes in manufacturing locations can also change the outcome of what's left over on the board. How about for lower level objective evidence, maybe not as extreme objective evidence. Here's some of the changes that we would need to consider. Changes in assembly location. Let's say we were manufacturing the exact same board uh, today in Illinois, and then tomorrow it's gonna to be moved to Mexico. Changes in cleaning parameters, like we increased the speed of cleaning or the pressure of the jets or the impingement angles. Changes in reflow profile temperatures. In other words, has the flux truly been completely activated? So what we really need to do is we really need to prove that the cleaning process removes all the soils that can be harmful when bias is applied and when temperature and humidity constraints are applied. And what we wanna make sure is that those species do not create problems in terms of reliability. It could be dendritic growth, it could be a variety of um, ionic species that are, are moving on the surface of the board and could cause potential electrical failure, uh, a type of electro migration. Pictured here is a typical ionic cleanliness test setup. And the thing you have to recognize is that you can use ionic cleanliness testing um, as a way to qualify your process or create objective evidence. But at some point you have to link it back to the electromigration or the moving of those uh, soils or species underneath bias conditions. Bias could be voltage and could be impacted by temperature or uh, humidity. So when those soils move, and they are active enough species to cause current flow, to cause the assembly to fail. Um, that's what we're trying to figure out. Is the board clean enough where that doesn't happen? So typically the testing that is done, and it's an IPC regulated uh, test technique, um, the boards are regulated, the test methodologies are regulated, is surface insulation resistance. So, Let's wrap this up uh, from 30,000 feet. Rose testing is gone. You have to determine if a cleanliness level can be achieved and you have to have objective evidence to determine at what level quantitatively a board is dirty or clean. And you're gonna have to link that back somehow to the reliability of the assembly. Rose testing again is an overall number of the assembly or a given affluent volume, and it is not a determinant of clean versus dirty. There is no exact um, number that one can use in either ionic cleanliness testing or surface insulation resistance testing. It's a function of the species being there on the board, the bias put on the board, um, the temperature and humidity constraints, uh, and the assembly itself. And you're going to have to do more work to determine what level of residues are acceptable so that the board does not prematurely fail. And this will be different for all of the operating environments, whether it be military, automobile, medical device, etc. So this has been an overview on section eight, which has to do with measuring cleanliness and the amount of residues on a printed circuit board assembly. This has been Bob Wetterman from BEST.